In this topic, we'll deal with the threats and vulnerabilities associated with terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. While it's understood that natural disasters ultimately pose more frequent risk management challenges in today's environment, the nexus of terrorism, crime, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is a primary crisis management concern, particularly for the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community, and the Department of Defense. From a general perspective, we can say that the sources of terrorism are highly uncertain, and thus terrorist acts are, su are surprises, hence, obviously, the crisis management side that we've talked about. So, in this topic, we will explore this reality and its impact on management. In this topic, we'll deal with the threats and vulnerabilities associated with terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. While it's understood that natural disasters ultimately pose more frequent risk management challenges in today's environment, the nexus of terrorism, crime, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is a primary crisis management concern, particularly for the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community, and the Department of Defense. From a general perspective, we can say that the sources of terrorism are highly uncertain, and thus terrorist acts are, su are surprises, hence, obviously, the crisis management side that we've talked about. So, in this topic, we will explore this reality and its impact on management. In this assignment, we will explore some specific threats. We will compare domestic and international threats. We'll look at conventional terrorist threats, such as the attacks in Mumbai, the DC sniper, and the London subway bombing. Then we'll also spend a little bit of time about talking about weapons of mass destruction and cyber terrorism. After this, we, after we've looked at these concepts, we will begin to discuss some of the tools that may be used and some of the approaches that may be used um, as part of a, a risk management or a risk decision-making paradigm. In this instance, these will include the risk action consequence matrix, which is a tool to assess the possible outcomes from decisions, the precautionary principle and its ramification for decision-making, and the concept of value at risk. Finally, we will conclude this discussion with, some, with a look at some of the consequences and mitigation strategies associated with risk management. September 11th, 2001 obviously changed Americans' national security perspective. The containment strategy that had formed the basis of American security policy since World War II had been, has been switched or replaced by a policy of preemption against potential threats. From a risk management perspective, this represents a shift from containing known or suspected threats to taking precautionary steps against potential threats, even before they may become imminent. The strategy shifts the burden of proof. For example, a state might be obliged to prove it is not developing nuclear weapons or supporting terrorism to avoid military action against it rather than a case in which the attacking state provides conclusive evidence or information that such a situation occurs. Or it might include preemption against the terrorist group, even though the group's threat to a specific country may not be known or well defined. Notwithstanding, this strategy, based upon potential enemies with uncertain capabilities and intentions, complicates risk management. Some the capability of the threat, well, who can hurt us, <clears throat> this shifts us from what we know as a capability threat, who can, hear, or who can hurt us, to a threat-based, who might be able to hurt us. And we have to contain the threat by taking precautionary steps before that threat becomes imminent. Examining the new security environment, we want to look at kind of a combination of domestic versus international threats and then conventional versus cyber or weapons of mass destruction threats. In some respects, you might be able to matrix this out in a two-by-two two table. 
if you are actually going to develop a threat management prospect. So for example, you might have domestic and international across the top and conventional and cyber or weapons of mass destruction, perhaps if I really it should be a three by two across the bottom. And then you can begin to identify your threats in each of the quadrants, um, allowing you to determine where your greatest concentration of threats may come from. Domestic versus international threats. This often deter is determined by where does the threat originate, who are the perpetrators. And in both cases, you want to know what the motives were for the, for the threat. On May 1st, the U.S. and the world celebrated the death of Osama bin Laden. While eliminating bin Laden provided a moral boost to the United States and others, we must avoid the countervailing risk associated with this, with this killing and become complacent that perhaps we have defeated terrorism. I think it would be foolhardy for us to think that is the case now. In fact, I would argue that the terrorist threat is greater and more diverse than it was 15 years ago, 14 years ago when 9-11 took place, and even a few years back when Osama bin Laden was actually killed. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to address terrorism as a crisis issue. Terrorism poses a risk to health, safety, and the environment. It poses a risk to society, ultimately, and to our way of life. Furthermore, in today's world, there are more jihadists, if we are thinking about Islamist extremism, than there were on 9-11. While there is no complete security against terrorism, good planning can mitigate its consequences. And thus, for uh, the next few lessons here, we're going, next few slides here, we're going to talk about how to effectively um, understand terrorist threats and then how to provide some uh, risk management planning and mitigation strategies around them. One of the things I think we need to understand is why is the terrorist threat so extensive today? Well, there's been a proliferation of, of groups intent on striking the U.S. This was not, as Michael Leiter said, the former director of the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, attacking the United States is the brass ring for terrorists. And this says for both domestic as well as international terrorists. So let's take a moment to look at some of these people on the slides and talk a little bit about where they come. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of the groups. The first person you see there are the first two, Abdul Muttalib and Anwar al-Alaki. Both worked for a group known as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Abdul Muttalib uh, was famous for the 2009 Christmas bombing or attempt to bomb a Delta flight from Amsterdam to Detroit, uh, the what we call the underwear bomb, where he failed in the end to ignite the bomb and fortunately was subdued by other passengers. The second person there then is Anwar al-Awlaki, who also was part of the IQAP or al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and has been known as a major inspirationalist for um, for a lot of people who seek to strike at the United States. The unique feature about Alaki is that he was an American citizen. Um, and he has very effectively used social media and modern uh, internet technologies to proliferate his message. Even though he was killed in 2011 by a U.S. drone strike, his messages continue uh, to, be, uh, to be available on the web, unfortunately, and a source of inspiration. The other thing we have to remember about AQAP, which makes them so threatening, is they were also the ones who tried the uh, May 2000 or October 2010, excuse me, cartridge bomb plot, where they actually replaced printer cartridges in, uh, com in computer printers uh, with the hope of shipping them through the supply chain and having them explode. The goal in this case was to uh, really cause damage to the supply chain. So AQAP is one example of someone who wants to strike at the United States and continues to be a threat to the United States. Actually, most counterterrorism folks in Washington talk about them as being the greatest threat. A second group that has also tried to strike the United States is the uh, what is known as the Pakistani uh, Taliban or Tariqa Talibani Pakistan, the TTP. And it was the TTP that went out and recruited and trained Faisal Shahzad, who in May 
of 2010, sought to set off a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device in Times Square. Luckily, Shazad wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed and was unable to bring the bomb to fruition, or it would have been a, a devastating attack. The, um, the key to Shazad in this was with the, the, the belief is that this was in retaliation for a U.S. drone strike who killed a TTP member, but it just speaks to another group that wants to strike at the United States. The fourth picture there is of the deceased Omar Hamami. Omar came from uh, Sheldon, Al Shelby, Alabama. Um, and actually went to fight uh, with Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda-aligned terrorist group in Somalia, rose up through the ranks to become a commander within that organization, has been virulently anti-U.S., uh, but ironically was killed by his own folks. Um, and uh, but, but speaks again to this attraction with Islamist extremism that seems to be felt uh, among a certain population of the United States. Right now, in 2015, it's estimated that somewhere around um, 100 in, to 150 Americans have sought to go overseas to join the group known as the Islamic State, uh, or what I like to refer to them as Daesh, which actually means to trample on in Arabic and is seen as a derogatory term by that group. I'll talk a moment about them a little more. But there are also a, a number of Americans who've gone to join al-Shabaab for, for various reasons. I mention this only because it's a risk in the sense that they may eventually decide to return uh, to the United States. The implications of which we're not sure of, uh, but there, there is basically right now research shows about a one in nine chance that these individuals will seek to execute a terrorist attack in the United States. There are not only external groups, though, that we need to be aware of. There are domestic groups, single-issue groups, and anti-government groups, groups such as the a Animal Liberation Front, who in 2005, the ALF, was included in the United States Department of Homeland Security planning document and listing as the number one domestic terrorist threat uh, that required the focus of U.S. resources. Since then, ALF, as it's known, ALF, has been replaced by the Sovereign Citizens, an anti-government group, as the number one threat. In the United Kingdom, ALF actions are regarded as examples of domestic extremism and handled by the National Extremism Tactical Coordination Unit that was set up in 2004 to actually monitor ALF and other illegal groups. What the Animal Liberation Front stands for is it's a single issue group. They are opposed to the use of animals in laboratory experiments, the, uh, the, the uh, production of animals for things such as fur coats uh, and, and veal, things like that. Another single in, uh, group is the Environmental Liberation Front, which obviously is opposed to and uses violent response uh, around uh, and the groups or against groups that they feel are a risk to the environment. Um, there is a group known as Revolution Muslim, uh, or now it's changed its name to Islam, poli Islam Policy that's based in... Um, New York City and is a radical hate group. So what we begin to understand is, and then there are the anti-government groups, uh, terrorist groups that would include such groups such as white supremacists, uh, I mentioned the sovereign citizens, uh, even the KKK. And if you want to find more information, you can look at all of these groups. Um, the thing that I, uh, I think, the thing that we have to understand with domestic groups is that a third of the suspects charged have been U.S. citizens, um, and there is an increasing campaign to attract Americans to a variety of forms of uh, a, a variety of forms of extremism. And beyond these groups, then there are what we might term the lone wolves. These are individuals who don't seem to have any direct connection. To, uh, to terrorist groups, but may have been inspired by some of their ideology and some of their messaging. 
Um, these are the consequences of these attacks tend to be less high risk, but that doesn't make them any more deadly. A good example of this would be Nadal Hassan, uh, the uh, individual who launched the attack at Fort Hood in November of 2009, walked into the recreation center on that military base and opened fire, killing 13 people. Last but not least, the, the groups that I think I need to mention here is ISIS. Um, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria is what that stands for, or what they like to be called the Islamic State, or what I like to refer to as Daesh. At this point, Daesh has made some threats about attacking the United States, but they seem to be focused primarily on developing a caliphate or an Islamic religious state in the area of Iraq and Syria. That's fine, but again, I, I uh, warn about complacency about this group. And one of the things we don't understand very well about terrorist groups is when they decide to shift um, their area of operation. We do know some things. For example, if they're squeezed militarily, such as Shabab, Al Shabaab has been recently in Somalia, they suddenly may look for other areas. Terrorist groups tend to be like an amoeba. You push them on one side, they move somewhere else. So with Daesh, I, I think the key is to keep a close look on them, seek to gather intelligence on them, and seek to do a little more research on, from a risk perspective on when these groups Look to, um, look to change their area of operation and then become even a greater threat. So let's look at some of the threats from an attack perspective then that we're talking about and some of the conventional threats. The map you see on the slide is actually the map of the 2002 DC sniper case, which was a random case where a gentleman by the name of Lee Malvo and John Muhammad terrorized DC with a shooting spree in which 10 people were killed and three more were wounded. Um, this went on for about three weeks. They tried to recruit additional uh, shooters. They claim to have um, extremist Islamist tendencies when they were finally arrested. They've been convicted uh, and, and, char uh, and I believe executed at this point. The question that we really have to look at with regard to this conventional threat is would we consider these terrorists or serial killers? Um, the difference, obviously, being serial killers would certainly be a law enforcement issue. The terrorist issue extends beyond law enforcement from a risk perspective because we need to look and see whether they were simply lone wolves or whether they had other, um, other uh, uh, accomplices that have not yet been discovered. At this point, 13 years after the fact, it seems that they were certainly lone wolves, and I think we can put that attack to rest. Um, another attack that, that is considered a, a game changer that you will uh, hear more about as we move through the course is the attacks on Mumbai in 2008 and why this attack is significant from a conventional threat is it used small mobile teams of terrorists to terrorize the city for about 60 hours killing more than 160 people this is India, the city of Mumbai, which is India's largest city, is its financial and entertainment center. This would be similar to an attack in the U.S. on New York City. Um, but some of the game changers was the small teams used conventional weapons, automatic weapons, uh, small explosives that they left behind them. But the real thing was that, that's very interesting in this is they integrated the use of, of technology to guide them. They had an external handler who watched the news feeds and the information coming from Indian security. So they were able to direct the teams. They communicated uh, via cell phones. They used GPS to guide them through their process and technologies such as GPS sensing, video uh, recordings and things like that had been used to plan for the attack. Um, uh, online searches, for example, for blueprints of operations. So this is another example. This was in 2008 of an attack. They concentrated their attack on what we would call soft targets, um, attacking hotels, attacking a Jewish cultural center, um, in, in the course of their rampage. They also attacked the Central Train Center, which kind of leads a segue into the next 
uh, conventional attack I want to talk about, which is the 7-7-2005 attacks uh, on the London subway. Uh, London often refers to it as it's 9-11, where four uh, perpetrators detonated four bombs almost simultaneously on, on three subway trains in, in a bus. Uh, 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 in a bus, 56 people died and 700 were injured. Again, an example of conventional weaponry being used to perpetrate terrorism. The last one uh, that I would talk about was a gentleman named uh, Mohammed Osman Mohammed Muham. I'm sorry, Mohammed, who tried to uh, who drove a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device to a tree lighting ceremony in Portland, Oregon, a few years ago, known as the Christmas Bomber. Uh, luckily, again, the bomb did not go off; it was able to be stopped. But what we see in all of these individuals is the conventional threat, the conventional threat of using conventional weapons and explosives um, in order to perpetrate terror. And we need to control for those in a risk environment. By unconventional threats, I mean chemical, biological, radioactive, nuclear, and high explosive kinds of, uh, of, of events and, uh, or, or weapons. These are what we would term, obviously, weapons of mass destructions, or WMDs. Now, this is an interesting topic in a risk course because this deals with a high-impact, low-probability event. It may not, the likelihood of it occurring is limited, but the probability is so high, and this really introduces us to the, content, the, the concept of value at risk that I'll talk about in a minute, where you need to be aware of these kinds of events because the effects are so devastating. I think most of us are aware of them. I'll give you one little example of a biological attack, and it goes back to 1763 at Fort Pitt out near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A gentleman by the name of, um, of Colonel Bouquet reported to Sir Amherst, the commander-in-chief of, of the British forces in North America, that he faced two problems, smallpox among his troops and Indian raids. And uh, Amherst suggested using one problem to solve the other. What he suggested was that Bouquet make a peace offering to the Indians of, inflect, of infected blankets which he did. Smallpox then erupted in the Indian community. There has been no record, there is no medical record that the two were connected, but this is clearly a possibility of the one of the first use or of a use of a biological weapon in a military case of examples. We do know that Al-Qaeda in the, uh, that Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda's core, had a lab that was looking to produce biological weapons um, we are aware of the 2002 anthrax attacks in the United States. Um, and the real concern about biological weapons is they can be self-propagating or they're contagious. They spread throughout society. Uh, chemical weapons we have been aware of. They've been used. Uh, most recently, the Syrian government has been accused of using um, chlorine gas against its own people in the, in the Civil War back in 2013. Radioactive weapons are contained with what we might call, um, uh, these would be either a, uh, a dirty bomb, where you take radioactive material, combine it with a traditional explosive, and um, allow it to, uh, to detonate, contaminating an area, uh, making an area unusual, un unusable. Nuclear weapons we've had for quite some time and, is, and are well known, I'm sure, uh, to many of you. I think the real key is that the, and, and the last would be high explosives. These would be considered weapons of mass destruction, might be something such as was used in the attack on um, the Alfred P. Murrah building um, back in, the, in 1995. Uh, this attack was uh, perpetrated by an anti-Americanist, um, who uh, anti-governmentist who was seeking to strike um, uh, Timothy McVeigh was the gentleman's name, who was seeking to strike uh, a blow at the U.S. government. That's why he targeted the building with a van stuffed with uh, high, enough high explosives to destroy the building. You can go see a picture of the building. That would be high explosives. 
to kind of bring this to um, into closure, there were a couple things. Um, there was a report uh, about four or five years ago by the Russian Security Council Secretary Nikolai Patrushev said that the extremist organizations are continuing to seek to acquire mass weapons of mass destruction. And his comment was, the terrorists are seeking to get access to facilities and technologies of chemical and biological weapons, radioactive weapons, technology agents, toxic agents, and biological formulas. And to kind of substantiate this, there was no, we know that Osama bin Laden made no secret of his attention to use a weapon of mass destruction against the United States. He even proclaimed that it was a religious duty for Muslim states to acquire nuclear, chemical, biological weapons to attack the West. Additionally, considering the availability of, of CBRN, CBRM, chemical, biological, radioactive, and nuclear weapons, and related technologies over the internet, this remains a significant threat that needs to be attention. Together with this is the, uh, together with these threats is also the um, increasing trafficking, both uh, illicit and legitimate transport of radioactive materials, which could be used for radioactive dispersal advice, the radioactive bomb that I discussed. Furthermore, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Authority, recorded 15, 1,562 incidents where nuclear materials have been lost or stolen between 1993 and 2008, mostly in the former Soviet Union, and 65% of those losses have never been recovered. So we also need to be aware that there are reports that have reported to an increased expertise of insurgents in making homemade bombs in Afghanistan, uh, that they used in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, which uh, the uniqueness of these uh, increases the potential for a radioactive destruct as destructive device. device. Um, an example of this uh, was a dirty bomb that was constructed but not detonated by uh, Chechen extremists in 1996, targeting uh, Moscow's um, uh, uh, Central Park in Moscow. So, I think all of what we need to understand here is that while the conventional threats have been perpetrated, we need to also understand that the unconventional threats are out there and do present a value at risk um, situation. The new form of terrorism that we need to look at is cyber terrorism. And this is really a nexus of terrorism and criminal activity. In 2008, there were over almost 5,500 intrusions via U.S. government on uh, government uh, computers. That number has escalated significantly since then and, and remains a growing concern. In fact, uh, recent documents found at Abbottabad and now translated and released. Uh, this was where Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden was killed in uh, 2011. Uh, released a talk about the interest in cyber terrorism against the West. The understanding that our, our interdependency with cyber networks is a true vulnerability. Um, this has also come together then, it's, it's merged with cyber crime. We've seen a number of incidents of fraud, of, of um, theft of personal identifiable information, credit card thefts, uh, cases in point, the tax at Home Depot and Target. Um, and all of these uh, are beginning to come together as, as various ways that terrorist organizations seek to use um, the, the vulnerability to seek to exploit the vulnerabilities of the internet, but also use the internet. And as we know also in, in 2015, the internet has become a very important vehicle uh, for exploiting terrorist organizations, for getting a general message out, causing shock uh, uh, within society, such as uh, the videos of the beheadings carried out by Daesh. Um, but also uh, looking to recruit new members to terrorist organizations, looking to build morale among the members of ter terrorist organizations, um, and ultimately sending uh, general comments to the world on what terrorist organizations stand on.
So what I think we really have to understand is that the cyber world is a world that we really need to spend more time on evaluating the, the risks that occur. There are multiple threats out there, threats from crime, threats from terrorist groups, and I didn't really mention the nexus. There's nothing that keeps a terrorist group from hacking in and collecting uh, um, credit card numbers, for example, and using those to increase their financial resources. So there is that, that crime terror connection. But what we really need to understand is the breadth of the cyber issue. Everything from training, recruitment, uh, radicalizing and exploiting terrorist groups to the potential for major attacks on um, on systems that would control uh, a variety of things that we do in society. Uh, one that might be of a major concern, if you would think about it, would be if someone were effectively able to hack the Federal Aviation Administration's websites and somehow take over the, the or bring down the air traffic control system in the United States and the havoc that that would cause. So cyber terrorism is definitely a new um, a new threat that's emerging, but also gives us a really good example of threats and vulnerabilities. So when we talk about risk, we've talked about this a number of times, risk equals the threats plus the vulnerabilities plus the consequences. That's what you look at when you try to determine what risk is. Um, so what are some of the risks? that we, or what are some of the consequences that we potentially see from the threats and the vulnerabilities we've been discussing um, in, in, the last, uh, in the last couple slides? Well, we can look at the thing of deaths, 160 people killed in Mumbai, uh, 58, 56 people killed in London, nearly 3,000 people killed in 9-11. That's a significant um, that's a significant number of, of casualties. But let's look at the use of a weapon of mass destruction, where we multiply those casualties by 10 times and begin to think of what the impact would be of 100,000 deaths and inju injuries resulting from the explosion of a nuclear device, uh, for example, in Times Square or in downtown D.C. So certainly the deaths and what the impact there would be. I think the, the second thing we have to think about is the long-term economic disruption that could be caused by this. You can go back and look at what happened after 9-11 and see how the stock market crashed following 9-11, uh, immediately after 9-11. The economic disruption, the billions of dollars that that cost. So that's another consequence that we need to be aware of. And then the third consequence, I think, is really, uh, and, and, and I'm very concerned about this, is the erosion of what our society stands for. Rule of law, uh, uh, human rights, protection of minority rights, things like this. And we see examples in the past where extreme events, where crises can have a major impact on social events. So, for example, 110,000 Japanese were interned after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. These were American citizens that were basically put in, uh, for lack of a better term, concentration camps um, to, uh, to, because they, there was a thought that they were a threat to the security of the United States. Or the Sedition Act of 1918 which made it a crime to use disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the U.S. government during times of war. And it was a sentence of up to 10 years that could happen at this point. So the other consequence, so we have the tragedy of human death and casualties, injuries. Uh, we saw this most recently in the last couple of weeks here in 2015 at the Sonarev trial where we had survivors of the Boston Marathon bombing talking about the, the injuries caused by terrorism, how it changed their life. So we have that terrible thing, terrible loss uh, and, and, and damaging of human life. We have the long-term significance of economic disruption and the cost of that. But then maybe most importantly, the real consequence that we look at here with the with terrorism is the erosion of social cohesion, the erosion of social values and the changing of government values.
Okay, so there we've talked about the threats, the vulnerabilities, the consequences, particularly as they relate to terrorism. Now, how do we begin to plan for this? Well, there's some really key concepts that are explained in the textbook that I'd like to go into, and I think these are, are key concepts as you begin to think about your crisis management strategies and as you think about um, and as you think uh, about even risk management strategies. The first thing I'd like to talk about, and Bracken does a good job discussing this, is something known as the precautionary principle. And according to Bracken, the precautionary principle is an uncertainty, that, he, or his comment is that uncertainty he has found in his research is no excuse for inaction against threats. And, and so what he's basically saying here is um, that in, in a risk management kind of environment, the precautionary principle may be taken by governments in, because they feel that the, the cost or the risk of inaction um, is worse uh, than taking an action. Uh, maybe the, the quintessential example of this would be the decision by um, George W. Bush to invade Iraq in 2003 on the supposition that they had weapons of mass destruction. Bush was implementing what we would call the precautionary principle um, here because his feeling was that the risk of the possibility that um, Saddam Hussein might have weapons of mass destruction outweighed, uh, outweighed the um, other risks or the countervailing risks, as we would talk, we'll talk about in a little bit, of not taking action. Um, and so, in other words, the precautionary principle is um, if you wait for proof, it might be too late. Um, and so what you look at is you really begin to shift the proof that the risk is not important um, onto other parties. And we will talk about how this influences uh, decision making and changes risk management paradigm in the next couple slides. But what the precautionary principle all ultimately does is it looks to act early to forestall, forestall a potential emerging risk or threat. It empowers governments to act before risk becomes a catastrophe. Um, it exceeds really the concepts of preemption and preemptive um, uh, action, uh, which are um, and presumes um, that that there are threatening future plans. And um, it, uh, it it places the burden of proving the risk on um, on other parties, or um, it allows the assessment of events in other ways. So. Um, what we need to really understand, I think that's what we need to understand about the, uh, about the precautionary principle, that it's part of the decision-making process, um, that people look at that and it's a real risk balancing kind of thing. We might, in this case, going back to some of the earlier lessons, use a decision tree in the planning process where we'll say, well, what's the risk if this happens and what's, if we take this action and if we take no action? So the precautionary principle, it's well outlined in the book. Um, I think we need to understand that. Value at risk. This is another term that impacts decision making in crises, in crisis and risk planning. And this talks about what is the worst case scenario for an organization. And it deals with basically three variables that we have to look at in the value at risk. What is the time period over which this threat or risk is evident? What's the confidence level that the threat may happen? And what's the amount of loss? In all reality, or in most reality, the value at risk is a look at the low probability, high consequence event. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say the probability of a weapon of mass destruction attack is low. It will say at about 1% a year, okay? But the impact of this is so significant, say 500,000 deaths, that when we do the math on this, we come out very quickly with a value at risk at 5,000. So what we're beginning to talk about is, okay, if this is a value at risk at 5,000, we need to spend some attention to it. Um, it the value at risk 
concept has widely been used in financial markets to answer the question of what is the worst case scenario for losses. Um, when it's transferred into the security environment as part of the risk management scenario, the, scenario, the components really remain the same. Time period, confidence level, how sure are you or how unsure are you? Um, but it is really, it's in, this, it's in the security area that this is really applied to, uh, it is really applied to the, um, sorry for the delay on this, is, is applied to the low probability, high uh, consequent event. I do want to say one thing about the value at risk, and that is that there have been some that say, and, and rightfully so, in my opinion, that value at risk cannot be simply reduced to a mathematical equation. Certainly the mathematical equation helps, but um, value at risk can be influenced by the psychological impact of, of the events. So I referenced um, in the last chapter the impact of 3,000 deaths in 9-11 versus 30,000 annual highway fatalities. The reality is in risk management, the psychological impact of the devastation of 9-11 was far larger on the American psyche. So what we need to understand in, in this is the precautionary principle and the value at risk, the convergence of these result in a what we would call a complex complex risk cons consequence assessment process and i will go now on to the next slide and talk about how we look at the risk consequence action um, matrix which i feel is a really outstanding uh, method of studying risk and threats for a specific event The matrix that you see on the screen here is used to conduct an assessment of options for a single event and offers an opportunity for decision makers to assess the consequences of their actions, hopefully before they take it. This is an important part of risk management and can be used very effectively. The risk action consequence, or RAC, is based on two independent variables. A true-false risk based on information that is gathered or risk information that you can see on the vertical axis. And the positive negative actions, or the actions that may be taken, that you can see on the horizontal action uh, on the horizontal axis. The cells in the matrix then are the result or the of the interaction of the two independent variables. So for example, if the horizontal axis reflects the actions taken, either a positive or negative action, a negative action may be no action, or in the case even, it may be no action in any case. Um, and then how the action intersects with the information. In the positive true case, the problem is assumed to be a risk and the action is taken. And the results are assumed to be positive for the acting country. Or put another way, the risk is mitigated. As I said, the vertical axis presents a threat assessment based on the assessment of the risk or the risk information that you have. Is the risk real or is the risk true? Or is the risk not real or is it false? Although divided into separate quadrants, the risk information is more of a continuum. At the very top is true information. Still not 100% because risk information like intelligence, is never 100% sure. And at the bottom, it is either primarily or almost certainly false, but again, probably not at a 0%. The key for the decision maker is that their risk information probably rests somewhere in between and is related to the extent to which it is either true or false. So once again, as we've seen so often in risk, we are not making the decisions on 100% uh, accurate information, we, are, we have to do some assumptions. So, in other words, as we think about this, how true or how false is the information that you're looking at? And from that perspective, what action would you take? So let's look again at the Katrina example that we've talked about before. The powerful hurricane is tracking towards New Orleans with a good likelihood of coming ashore in the nearby vicinity in five days. Decision makers, so here there's the, we see, think this is a fairly true risk information. 
In this case, decision makers decide to take a positive action. An evacuation is ordered, and thus, when the hurricane hits, the loss of life is dramatically reduced. Looking at this another way is maybe the false negative, the quadrant down on the lower right of the slide. The false negative is just as clear. Here the hurricane is tracking away from New Orleans. The risk information is it's not going to hit New Orleans. And it is not deemed a risk. Therefore, the evacuation is not ordered or no action is taken. And again, um, <clears throat> since the risk does not materialize, the status quo remains. And you didn't expend the, you didn't, uh, expend the resources of the evacuation. However, it must be noted in the false negative that you are not improving Nor Nor Orleans' capacity to deal with the hurricane. You simply did not order the evacuation side of things. Um, so the real key to this, or the real cost of decision making then, of, uh, is realized in the false positive and the true negative quadrants, right? I mean, you obviously absorb cost when you take positive action, but the thought is if you take positive action, on information that turns out to be positive, you've reduced less costs. It's the other ones that now become more problematic. So let's look at this. <clears throat> In the case of the false positive, the problem ends up being less of a risk than initially was thought. However, action was taken. This is the po false positive quadrant, right? However, action was taken resulting in the development of countervailing risks. In the case of <clears throat> of Katrina that we just talked about, people are displaced, which outside them, they vote against the mayor in the next relay, in the next <clears throat> in the next uh, election. It is also the uh, quadrant of unintended consequences, which may be either positive, an ancillary benefit, or negative, a countervailing risk. We'll talk more about those in a second. While the false, false positive has risks, the true negative is even more costly. Here the decision is made not to act, but the hurricane hits, causing major damage and loss of life. This is, in essence, a mirror of what happened in Katrina in, in reality. It is this scenario that often prompts leaders, however, or it's the impact of this scenario that often prompts leaders to, make, to decide to act in order to, well, in order to minimize the severity of events. Now, this is okay if you are talking about a significant event where the variables at risk, time, confidence, and loss, um, and we, we've talked about the value at risk, I'm sorry, the value at risk, time, confidence, and loss, we've talked about those, and they may influence a decision to take action even regardless of what your information might be. So if there is any information that there's a nuclear bomb in Washington, D.C., you might decide <clears throat> to order some kind of evacuation, perhaps. Or in the case of New Orleans, you may have decided to evacuate the city even though the information was not solid on where the hurricane would hit. The other thing that comes out of the false positive side, or the other impact of the true negative is a reliance on the precautionary principle, which we also have discussed. And it's the precautionary principle that actually manifests itself in the false positive cell because it's in this cell where you take the action, but it is directly connected to the true negative. People take the precautionary principle in response perhaps to it to a potential terrorism act because they feel the cost of not acting is too high. Thus, you take action becomes the primary independent variable and the information becomes secondary. I hope this is clear. We'll use this again, but this quadrant or this matrix is a very powerful matrix for decision making, particularly in the planning stage of things. And I say that from this perspective because if you, you use it in the planning stage so that you understand the actions, and as I said, these are continuum, particularly on the risk information. So if you delve more into the RAC, you could begin to break down the information, perhaps by percentage, and that may influence your decision. I've shown you a very cursory approach to how you would use this, but I think you will see by looking at it that the opportunity to apply the RAC 
to a range of variables becomes much more significant uh, the more time you have to work with it. Okay, so on sli the previous slide we talked about the risk consequence action matrix and explained how that excuse me how that works. Um, now let's take a little bit of a look of this and, and talk about how this, the role of value at risk, and then ultimately the precautionary principle fits into dealing in a counterterrorism environment. Counterterrorism operates in an environment of uncertainty. If we go back to the Cold War, I know ancient history for many of you, we pretty much knew the capability of the Soviet Union. We knew we could count the tanks and the men that they had. We knew what kind of weapons they had, and we knew where they were located. It's very hard to hide an armored division, for example. What was unknown was their intent. And um, although we tried to understand the membership of the Soviet Politburo, the rule, ruling group, um, to see if we could identify it, we still were not sure or could not be clear on what their intent was. In today's environment, the risk environment's been changed. We know the intent very quickly um, of, of, uh, of, of uh, a violent extremism. Violent extremism's intent is to inflict damage and destruction on the U.S. What we don't know about it is the capabilities, the location, the memberships, and even the weaponry, to a great extent, of these organizations. Thus, there's a lot of incomplete or uncertain information being used. Some people talk about this playing chess where there are no rules and you only get to see pieces periodically on the chessboard. So, with this incomplete information and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, insecurity, this becomes a high value at risk discussion. A key part of this risk management, uh, and, and thus value at risk, becomes a, com, uh, a key part of the counterterrorism strategy. One of those is stopping Al Qaeda or others from a, a acquiring of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. So one might say, if we follow this through, well, we have this high consequence, high risk. So why don't we implement the precautionary principle here? Well, the key is that the precautionary principle can lead you down a dangerous path. And so the precautionary principle needs to be tempered by assessing opportunity costs, and that is what other things we might be doing, and the counterfailing risks um, associated with those actions. And you saw some of that when we talked about it within the terms of the matrix, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some formulas, because the textbook really does a good job of discussing the differences of opinion of where the precautionary principle fits into the lexicon of war, preemptive war, preventative war. Preemptive being war might be imminent, or from your perspective is imminent, and you take, a, you take action against it. 1967, the Israelis strike in a preemption. Preventative war is war is just not only imminent but inevitable, and hence you take preventative action in that case. So it fits in, so the whole precautionary principle fits into that lexicon of war, but then it also has legal ramifications of when you might use it. So it's important to note that the application of the precautionary principle depends heavily on your risk assessment, which needs to be based on intelligence estimates and threat information. It goes on in the textbook to talk about uh, some good information on the failures of intelligence, which would reinforce, um, which we reinforced in the previous topic as well. So again, what we're saying is that None of these uh, tools, I guess, that we're dealing with right now should be used in an individual or, or a single environment. So we've talked about the precautionary principle. We've talked about value at risk. So in analyzing precaution and conducting risk management in response to a threat, it's important to understand the following, what I think is a very important formula. Reduction of the targeted risk, TR, plus the ancillary benefits. What are things outside of the elimination of the initial threat that you want to eliminate? Those are on the positive side of your equation. On the negative side, or on the other side, the comparative side of the equation, 
are the cost. What is it going to cost you to do it financially, but also what are the opportunity costs? Uh, what might be the political costs of an action? And again, the Iraq war presents some interesting information. And then what are the countervailing risks? What are the new risks that emerge from an action? So I think you begin to see, I hope you begin to see how this is such an important concept when we formulate risk management plans and crisis response plans. Um, this formula really should be used both prior to taking action, ex ante, and after an action, post ante, to collect lessons learned and to provide sound foundation for applying risk management to threats, what we might call using the after action reports. So let's take a quick minute here to define the terms before we move to a discussion uh, around the mitigation. So reduction of targeted risk. Reduction of targeted risk is reducing the threat. That is, it, reducing the threat is the primary goal of the action. Hence, if we think about Iran in 2015 and their nuclear capabilities, the threat reduction is reducing Iran's capability to develop a nuclear weapon. It can be low probability, as discussed above in the weapon of mass destruction. Um, and as we said before, low probability is not a reason for ignoring risk. Thus, going back to the Iraq war, to the, the, the target of the reduced risk was nuclear proliferation. It saw the implementation of the precautionary principle and it was believed to be justified in this case. So risk management plans need to consider how to reduce the targeted risk. First and foremost, that's what your risk management plan needs to do. Um, and how are those risks identified and prioritized within your organization? The ancillary benefits are positive unintended consequences. These are results from your action um, that, that were not necessarily intended, but are benefits of the action. So um, you have to consider, for example, do counterterrorism strategies result in ancillary benefits? So let's think of this. One might consider building schools in Afghanistan as an ancillary benefit, or Libya's decision to give up weapons of mass destruction after the invasion of Iraq. After the invasion of Iraq, in 2003, the Libyan government ultimately decided that it probably wasn't worth the risk of keeping nuclear weapons or keeping weapons of mass destruction, not nuclear. They did not have nuclear weapons, but chemical weapons and biological weapons and gave them up in 2005. This was not an intended benefit of, um, of the Iraqi invasion, but it was an ancillary benefit of the Iraqi invasion. Another way of looking to, uh, might be um, reducing the power of, uh, of drug lords in um, Latin America may result in greater democracy. That, uh, the greater democracy would be the ancillary benefit of what's going on um, in all of this. So, um, there are other things that we think about that are examples in the text of ancillary benefits. Resilience, uh, improved transportation safety, uh, diversion of, of things. So think about your own. But it's important to understand that ancillary benefits are not, do not, are not directly tied to the reduction, or they are directly tied to the reduction of the risk, but they are separate and unintended from the risk. Third are the costs that we need to look at. This is on the right side. And this could be financial costs, this could be loss of life, it could be international prestige, political, uh, political loss. Um, it might be opportunity costs, what was sacrificed to take the action. John Mueller at Ohio State University has done a lot of uh, research on the, the aspect within the regard of counterterrorism. And his argument is that the financial cost and the cost to Americans' privacy in the uh, aftermath, or he asked the question is, is the, is the financial cost and the cost to societal privacy in the United States really worth the benefit that we've achieved? Interesting concept, but it gives a really good context around the cost. The last thing then that we want to talk about in this formula is countervailing risks. These are the actions that, um, that, that, that emerge when one risk is addressed. 
but it creates other risks. These need to be understood for effective risk management. Unfortunately, human decision making is based on risk trade-offs. This is part of our satisfying decision making process, which means we often settle for the first solution that satisfies our goals, but that solution may not be optimal and may not consider the countervailing risk. So in Moscow, in 2002, and again at the school in Beslan in 2004, Russian counterterrorism authorities made a decision to storm the venues where hostages were being held um, in an attempt to free them. In both cases, the result was high civilian casualties. Later in the course, we'll discuss this in greater detail. But what it speaks to is they didn't think about the countervailing risks. So optimally, Risk superior strategies um, should be sought that reduce multiple risks, and that should be the goal of risk management. That's why you plan risk management uh, early on. Um, in in counterterrorism, we have seen some of this. So we've seen, or, or we've seen the fact that, uh, and we've seen the failure of this also. That when a military targets become too risky for the terrorists, they move and attack soft targets like hotel transportation system. Um, uh, or while al-Qaeda core in Afghanistan and Pakistan is being pounded, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula emerges. So this relates back to the fact that ideally in a risk management process, you would look for the optimal solutions, and that would include identifying what counter uh, what countervailing risks may occur. Unfortunately, what really happens here is that resources, time, money, personnel, to look at all these things are not really that available. Another thing we need to look at is what we would call blowback or collateral damage from what happens. Um, and we've talked about this before, or we, uh, we've touched on this a little bit before, but what's the impact of trying to kill a terrorist leader who happens to be at a wedding, and the result is collateral damage among the civilians of 10 people? In the end, have we created more terrorists than the one that was eliminated? This is all examples of countervailing risks. And this is those countervailing risks that make the decisions of risk management so difficult. So what's being prescribed in the initial part of this topic is a more systematic and institutional approach to counterterrorism and managing of government power in a crisis. Policy decisions should consider and understand the expected and unexpected consequences emanating from decisions and not solely focus on reducing the targeted risk. To achieve this objective, it's important to understand the threats, but also to conduct uh, the exhaustive risk analysis to the extent that's possible given the time constraints of the crisis to ensure consequences are understood. The new environment that we're talking about in this, in this formula is fraught with emotions, and the purpose of risk analysis and risk management is to reduce emotional response and try to increase rationality as part of, of the equation of risk management. I would suggest that you go back and review a little bit of the blowback section, pages 166 to 170 in Bracken, um, and see uh, how these go back and how, you know, are, what are the issues perhaps uh, from your perspective and how do they influence uh, risk management. Maybe a good topic of discussion uh, for the public discussion forum. What are some mitigation strategies that we might look at in risk management when we deal when we look at the threats that we've talked about? Well, using communication systems to gather data and improve situational awareness, intelligence gathering is 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 um, uh, is important. Some of this is uh, comes from the public perspective, developing and implementing consistent mechanisms for reporting suspicious activities. You can report suspicious activities now online. The Pennsylvania State Police have uh, have come out with an app that talks about it's a see send app, where if you see something, you take a picture and you can send it right away uh, to the Pennsylvania Criminal Intelligence Center for analysis. Um, second part of communications is establishing communication messages to alert personnel uh, when there are problems, 
when situations are occurring. Third, um, and of greater, uh, of greater debate, is the idea of internal surveillance systems um, that might be accessible to law enforcement. Uh, data mining of social, of social media are some of the big areas where we get into the debate around privacy. A second mitigation strategy is training. This includes learning from past experiences. It's to familiarize what's happened in the past um, among security personnel, but also among analysts so that we can begin to look for patterns. Um, we look to deny and, and prevent pattern recognition by our adversaries. So we modify security procedures, placement of barriers, timing of perimeter controls, changing routes of travel, things like that. Um, and continued surveillance, again, is a major area of, um, of, of consideration. Interagency cooperation is a third mitigation strategy. Um, this is the opportunity to bring multiple people together to do tabletop exercises so that we understand what the response of organizations might be and how they would respond in a crisis and full based uh, training exercises. And as we go through the course, in the second half of the course, we'll talk a lot more about this. But the, the interagency thing looks to coordinate security forces um, and looks to coordinate action among law enforcement, the private sector, federal agencies, things like that. Physical security is a third mitigation. This is a primary, this is primarily the last line of defense. This is defense, this is physically the fence before you breach a perimeter, such as the White House. Um, it, but it, it, the physical security can be installation of barriers. It can be the deterrence of cameras. But most of these are deterrent, uh, physical uh, or deterrent strategies that raise the cost of trying to attack things like this. Um, and, and I think what we need to be aware of is there cannot be a preponderance of emphasis on physical security because it really is the last line if it's breached. And then the last part would be what we might talk about and what Bracken would certainly talk about is managing the uh, environment. So what's a good example of managing the environment? Well, perhaps the concept of the three no's with regard to weapons of mass destruction. No proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, i.e. that would be no states that are gaining weapons of mass destruction. No new nuclear states not allowing new states to become nuclear, and no nascent nuclear states, allowing states to be close to what we call in the WMD environment breakout potential. And so what in this case we're doing is managing the environment. Um, we're securing existing uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, supplies. We're seeking to reduce and destroy those that exist so they don't fall into the hands of others. But this is an example of trying to manage the strategic environment, which is a really effective um, which is really an effective mitigation strategy and, and fits nicely into risk management. We'll talk about more of this mitigation approaches and break some of these down later in the course, but I wanted to just introduce some of the mitigation strategies at this point.